Hello and welcome to mini lecture 8 on the scientific procedure. My name is Dr Martin Hughes. In this mini lecture we're going to introduce you to the scientific report. This may be really important if you're doing advanced higher biology back in Scotland or the science extension here in New South Wales or even advanced biology in uh, the United States. You will probably be asked to provide a scientific report and hopefully the virtual hide videos have been useful to you already but writing the report is something you guys are probably the most worried about because it is still quite a lot of work to do. So in the next three videos I break down the scientific report into bite-sized chunks and hopefully allow you guys um, an opportunity to understand what we would expect in a scientific report. I use the term scientific manuscript and scientific paper interchangeably I mean the same thing, we're talking about the scientific report. So we're finally at the end of the scientific procedure in terms of conclusion. We've looked at the other five steps and conclusion is just another way we're going to present the results that we found in the virtual hides. So in the last video we rejected or failed to reject our null hypotheses and we've collected all of our relevant data and, and did some analysis. So hopefully by now you'll have a box plot. We may have some tables, which I'll discuss how we can copy and paste them in in the next video. And we'll have an ANOVA summary table. So we have a lot of information that allows us to now get to our report and tell everyone what we found. In this video, we will give you advice on how to start writing your scientific report. And like the scientific procedure, we have a list of instructions that we can follow. And there are certain features that have to be included in your scientific report. Um, and these are headings that you may be familiar with, you may not. Also, just for your reference, if you go to inspiringecology.com, www.inspiringecology.com, uh, you'll find some resources that are going to be necessary for writing um, the scientific report. And I'll show you how to navigate the website shortly. Right now, though, um, what I want to talk about is the scientific report itself and then I'll explain all that in a wee minute. So, now that we have some results and know what we're doing with our null hypotheses, we need to articulate this to the wider world. And in science we do this by producing a scientific paper or a scientific manuscript. And most scientific manuscripts will be published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And peer review means that it will go off to some other scientists who are maybe experts in their field and they'll look over your data and your paper and decide whether or not it's good enough to be published but more importantly they'll give you feedback and they'll give you co uh, comments and this is all anonymous so they give you anonymous comments um, and if it gets accepted and published and um, this is called peer review so it's getting reviewed by your peers um, in your, your realm of academia wherever that may be and you would try and publish your manuscript in a high impact journal related to your field so we don't want to publish this um, in you know, the local newspaper. We're publishing this in a, a journal related to our field. So for me specifically, um, I'm specialised in freshwater ecology and evolutionary biology. So I'd be looking at that sort of um, world for journals. So I've published a few papers in fish journals and there that's pretty good for what I want. Um, if you were a chemist, you'd be looking at chemistry journals or I'm an immunologist, you'd be looking at immunology immunology journals so um, we need to have a think about that later on but before we get ahead of ourselves we actually need to write something um, so we need to write the scientific report and all reports or manuscripts or papers follow the same format in biology chemistry and physics and you may have came across these headings before you may have not that's that's fine um, but I don't think these headings are changing anytime soon so if you learn this now and you get familiar with it and you do pursue a career in science um, this is it this is what you'll be doing for your career you'll be always constructing your paper using this formula hopefully that's the way i approach it as well so hopefully this is helpful and getting you through potentially your final years at high school or your early years at undergraduate or potentially your dissertations as well using this as a, a sort of revision tool to help guide you when you write your own reports so hopefully this is useful and it's the way that I still approach things now in the real world, so it is good. Okay, the six main things 
I'd expect to see in any scientific manuscript would be the abstract. That's the first thing I would see. Uh, an introduction, then my material methods, then a results section, then a discussion, and finally a reference list. And we're going to tackle each one of these um, segments individually and hopefully make it a bit easier for you guys to start writing your report. In this video, I'm going to focus on the introduction and materials. And you may be wondering, why am I not looking at the abstract? I'm not dismissing the abstract, it is really important. However, as you'll see as we go along in this video tutorial, you realize that abstract actually writes itself without you even thinking about it. So I'm not going to talk about the abstract again, but I'm not dismissing it. It is extremely important. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to look at the introduction and the material and methods. Okay, so what is this shape here on the right hand side? Well, there's a fantastic paper that is a, I've linked to in my website um, that talks about writing for undergraduates, scientific writing made easy. And this is probably the best image that I was ever taught, the best thing I was ever taught about writing a scientific paper. Basically, I was told, if you think about a scientific paper like an hourglass structure and follow that structure, then you'll never really go wrong when you write a scientific manuscript. So what do I mean by that? We can see on the left-hand side I have an introduction, then I have my material methods and my results, and then I have my discussion. And to the right-hand side of my introduction, we have the hourglass, and the broadest part of the hourglass is right at the top, and it gets narrower and narrower. At the narrower points, we have the material methods and results, and then we have a discussion, which starts off narrow and broadens out again as the hourglass um, reflects the shape at the top. So, what do we mean by that? Essentially, what we're saying is your introduction should start off broad. You should talk, talk about all the things related to your topic that is relevant, um, but the broadest, talk about your topic in the broadest terms possible. And then as you go through your introduction, paragraph by paragraph, you get more and more specific. And finally, your final paragraph in your introduction will be related to exactly what you did. And then when we talk about the material methods, we can't really talk about anything other than your material methods in that section. So it's very, very narrow in terms of scope. And the same with the results. We can't talk about anything other than what you found. What, what did your data tell you? So again, this is very narrow. Then in the discussion, the first paragraph in your discussion will be quite narrow as well. We're just talking about what did you find specifically in your scientific report? What did you find out? And then as we go down the hourglass, we maybe write another paragraph in the discussion. We can broaden that out. And by the end, the last paragraph, we could be talking about why is your data important to the wider world? Um, so we're really trying to contextualize your data into the broad topic. So this is what I'm referring to when you talk about the hourglass structure. Hopefully this becomes clearer as we go through, um, but it's really important. If you can follow this shape in your report, then you're going to produce something that's, that's pretty, pretty good. So we want to follow the structure and this is the way I approach every single paper um, that I write now. So let's start with the introduction, just the top of the hourglass. Our introduction should start off broad, like the top of an hourglass, and your first paragraph should introduce the main topic of your study. So essentially, what is your study about in the broadest terms? And why is this important globally, or at least in different parts of the world? And can you give examples from across the world that are relevant to the main topic you're talking about? So let's contextualize that. Let's put that into terms of what we're looking at in terms of the virtual heights. So this is what our introduction might start like. Paragraph one, you can see here, um, the broadest part of the top of the hourglass. Our study, just to remind ourselves, we investigated birds feeding in Australia. So we may want to find, uh, we may want our first paragraph to relate to the importance of birds globally. So the main thing we're talking about here is birds. So we want to, be, want to be really broad. So why are birds important globally? So we might do some research and find birds are important because they're great pollinators. Um, they're fantastic at dispersing seeds, which is really important for plant growth. 
They're important predators of pests such as mosquitoes and flies. Um, but they're also key prey species for a bunch of other animals as well in the food chain. So essentially they're really important to ecosystems. Birds are really important to ecosystems. And we can talk about that maybe in the first paragraph. That's very broad, okay? We're talking about birds globally are important for a number of reasons. Paragraph two then, we're getting a little bit more narrow. We're talking about Australian birds specifically. So why are birds so important in Australia? You may want to talk about the high diversity of birds in Australia, such as the parrots. Within the parrots, we have things like cockatoos and lorikeets. They're really important, really diverse. A lot of the birds in Australia are actually endemic. Now endemic means they're not found anywhere else in the world. So that's, that's important. So we're talking about Australian birds being endemic. And as well as being important for ecosystems, like we've already discussed, um, they're important for ecotourism. As I said, a lot of the birds here in Australia are not found anywhere else. So that attracts a lot of people, not unlike myself, to come to a country like Australia to see all of the amazing wildlife, including the bird species. So they're potentially good um, for the economy as well in terms of ecotourism. And if we're talking about ecological topics or challenges or issues that may be facing Australian birds is that there seems to be some evidence suggesting that they're declining in number and that could potentially be due to the introduction of non-native invasive species. So that's important. So these are the th sort of things I'd be incorporating into my second paragraph. So you can see we started off really broad talking about birds globally, important pollinators, seed dispersal. And in paragraph two, I'm getting a little bit more narrow. I'm talking about Australian birds specifically. Paragraph three then, we're getting even more specific. What we're actually talking about in this study is feeding Australian birds. We're artificially feeding them. Um, that's what the whole topic has been about. So we're not just talking about birds globally or birds in Australia, we're talking about birds feeding in Australia. So we may want to introduce some themes here. What is the general view of feeding birds in Australia? Is it good or bad? Some scientists suggest we shouldn't feed birds as it may spread disease, increase the reliance of native species on artificial food sources, um, and it may actually favour non-native species who benefit from having increased uh, amount of resources available to them. So that could be a really interesting train of thought, perhaps, for your third paragraph. But hopefully, what you can see is we're going through these paragraphs, we're getting very, very specific now in terms of what we're discussing in the introduction. So, finally, in our fourth paragraph, and it might not even be a full paragraph, uh, this may just be a few sentences, but in the final paragraph of the introduction, we want to be really specific about what we did. And you may wish to state your null and alternative hypothesis here. In fact, I'd recommend it. And uh, so what is this study about? So you may say something like this, based on the information provided in the introduction, i.e. the importance of birds, it is important to study their behavior and the potential impact of non-native species on native Australian species. I can spot my typo here. Therefore, without any, uh, we investigate if different species of birds spend a variable amount of time at a feeding station. Okay, so this is really, really specific now. I'm outlining basically what we did. What did we do in this paper? Um, what was our experiment? So again, I know I'm laboring a point, but I hope it's becoming really clear in your head how I would expect the introduction to look. If I was a reader reading your paper, I'd be expecting to see the big picture stuff at the start. Um, what is your topic all about? Birds, okay. Paragraph two, Australian birds, okay, perfect. Paragraph three, feeding Australian birds, okay. Paragraph four, I know what your null hypothesis is. I know exactly what you were testing. Okay, so hopefully that structure makes sense now in terms of the hourglass. We're getting narrower and narrower um, as we get closer to our material methods. So by the end of the introduction, the reader is crystal clear about what it is you guys are investigating. Okay, so now that we've reached the bottom of the first half of the hourglass, we're now moving into the material and methods section. And like I say, that's 
really, really narrow. We can't really talk about anything other than our material methods. So we, we don't talk about anything other than material methods. In the first few mini lectures, I spoke about repeatability. I think I said repeatability is vital for any experiment and that is still the case. Our material methods is like a, blue, a blueprint, um, like a list of instructions that would allow somebody, anyone in the world, to repeat your experiment. And you might not think that's too important in terms of the virtual hide stuff, um, but it is really, really important actually. Um, just to give an example, if you were an immunologist or a biochemist and you were creating a new medical drug um, and you thought, oh my God, I've found something that could really um, increase the lifespan of some people with certain cancers or reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. That's obviously fantastic and amazing breakthrough, but you would need to repeat that experiment hundreds, if not thousands of times before you could administer it to anybody. And you want to ensure the accuracy of your result and make sure that what you're saying is true. And to do that effectively, you need to give an extremely detailed list of instructions that must be left for others to follow. And that's what we'll provide you guys with just now. So with regards to this experiment, you obviously didn't personally film the birds, I did that. Um, so I provided the material methods, but I just need to reiterate how important the material methods are to the report. I need to be able to repeat your experiment if I read my methodology. If you read your own methodology back, and it's maybe unclear about what it is you did to yourself, then it's going to be really unclear to the reader. So you have to be crystal clear. Um, and your methodology, the way that you approach the virtual hides may um, change slightly from what I did. If you approached it slightly differently, slightly differently that's fine. Um, but what I'll show you just now is the material methods that I have provided for you guys. So if you go to www.inspireonecology.com, I will put a link to this in the description. I'll click on that. Okay, so when that loads up, you'll see a few screens, a few tabs. We're gonna click on online lessons. And then we're gonna look at practical resources. And if you see here, this might look slightly differently next time. I think I will change this. These aren't the catchiest of titles, as you can see. Um, I might change this, but it will be along the lines, if not still the same, material methods for virtual hides. So if you click on that, it opens up a PDF, which you can download. Uh, we'll just zoom out a little bit. Okay, material methods for virtual hides. And here we go. So a single page, but I outline everything that I did to conduct this experiment, even down to the brand of birdseed that I used. Okay, we, that's how specific we need to be. And I even talk about the brand of laptop I used, the operating system, and the formulas we used in Excel, embedded formulas for standard deviation, all the things that we covered in the videos. So if you download that and copy and paste it into your report, that's fine. Um, if you're obviously doing your own experiment, it's going to look different, but you may use this as a guide. And if you can get this level of precision and accuracy, um, you're doing well. So we need to be able to repeat this experiment exactly the same way you did it. Okay, we'll close that for now. Okay, so hopefully you know where to find that. And I think that's us for this video. In the next video, I want to discuss results and discussion. And in the, the last video that I'm going to put up on the scientific report, we'll talk about the reference list and the abstract as well. As always, if you could like, subscribe and follow, that would be fantastic. It'd be great to hear from you. I've had quite a few comments. Uh, you can email me personally via the Inspiring Ecology website. And you can also follow us on Twitter at inspiring underscore eco and myself at Dr. Martin Hughes. Thanks again.